Take your Bible, turn to Mark, <laughs> chapter 9. <laughs> Uh, my son was um, doing a speech for a speech class. He couldn't take this podium. It, that's exactly what it, Why didn't you use this one for your speech? Because this one's sturdy. It's more professional. Mel Robinson made that. Gone on to be with the Lord now. Amen. Well, Mark chapter 9. Now we're in good shape. I mentioned this last Sunday night that I would probably talk about this tonight. And this is, this is one of those I like to teach stuff like this because it's fun and a little laid back and Maybe a blessing to you. Mark chapter 9. The language of the King James is right. And uh, thank you for that, John. I'm going to start referring to him as the man upstairs. And um, this Bible's right in what it says. It doesn't need correcting. The grammar is also correct because it says, Where their worm dieth not. And I've always heard people, they change that. They'll say, Where the worm dieth not. And that's not what it says. It says, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And so, I want to give you a, maybe a, a little bit of a different explanation of this. But let's read it. Mark chapter 9, verse 43. Well, let's read uh, verse 42. Whosoever sh shall offend one of these little ones... That believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, he were cast into the sea. Amen to that, right? Children today are at major, major risk. And uh, what a shame that it's even coming from the church. Um, I told you the story of a independent, fundamental King James Bible preaching pastor. Bristol, Virginia, was maliciously, and I don't know how he did it a bunch of times, but was raping girls in his church, and it finally caught up with him, and he, he was going to make, I'll tell you how reprobate this man was, he was going to make those girls testify against him in court. And he was using that as a manipulation tool to get the prosecutor to give him a lesser sentence. So anyway, this Bible's right. Amen. Verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Did you know that verse 44 is missing? Out of the NIV, New American Standard, New English Version, Message Bible, Christian Standard Bible. Verse 45, And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter, it in, enter halt into life than having two feet, be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. That verse also missing out of the modern Bible translations. Verse 47, If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. That verse is not missing 
out of the modern translations. For some reason, they decide to take it out twice, but leave it in once. Uh, verse 49, for everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. In Matthew chapter 5, there's a little bit different version of that part of it where Jesus said, this is his Sermon on the Mount, and he said, uh, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt, in verse 13, but if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. And I heard Brother Kelly preach this one time, and he said, this is why the churches in America, this is why our Christian-based systems in America are being trodden under the foot of men. Because in, in a large part, the American churches have lost their savor, and they're good for nothing. And we are being trodden under the feet of men in this country. There is no respect now for church or for churches in general amongst the American public and especially uh, amongst those in government. And uh, we're losing court cases. We're losing uh, freedoms. We're losing morality in this nation. And this Bible is true. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray, dear God, that you would guide us into all truth. Lord, I don't think. God, that I have all the truth. I don't think that everything that I say is true. And Father, I just pray, dear God, that you would just lead us and guide us tonight. Lord, I don't want to say anything that's just deliberately wrong. So I pray, dear God, that you would guide us into all truth and give us an understanding, Lord, of your word and what it says and what it means. And Lord, help us, dear God, to define it uh, the way Scripture would define it. I pray, dear God, that you would just enlighten our hearts Help us to be a blessing, Lord, to your people tonight. We love you and we thank you for this Bible and what it says and what it means. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Now, if you were to, in fact, let's go to, um, I'm going to skip around in my notes here a little bit. Let's go to Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter 1. There's two possible interpretations of where the Bible says, their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. If you study worms in the Bible, um, you're, you're gonna, I'm going to present to you tonight what, pretty much what you'll find. Uh, there's two ways that the Bible will give you or use the word worm or worms. Uh, in the scriptures, I'll give you the English definition of the word worm. Uh, it's up there on the screen. But anyway, worms consume. Worms consume. We know that uh, any carcass that lays out in nature, then flies are attracted to a dead body. Flies are attracted to live bodies too. Okay, but they love dead bodies because any carcass laying around, it's in their nature. If they see a dead carcass, then they fly right to it and they will lay their eggs on that carcass and those eggs will hatch and they will, what comes out are worms. We call them maggots and maggots consume. Nature has a way of taking care of itself. You don't have to fear that an animal carcass of any kind doesn't need a funeral, doesn't need a burial. Nature has a way of taking care of that. The flies and the maggots will, will do their job. They'll clean that thing out. They'll do a good job of it. In, in old time, and I would say probably amongst nations where their healthcare system isn't quite as advanced as ours, they still use maggots. If someone has a real serious infection, they will still use maggots and use the maggots to eat the infected dead material off of that. Once the infected dead material is gone, then they'll try to close up the womb and, and let, wound and let it heal itself. But that's just one of the things that nature does. God designed it this way. Worms 
like to go and eat things. There's worms that eat carcasses, worms that eat live flesh. Uh, if you ever want to be grossed out, look up bot flies on YouTube. That's bad. These big nasty flies down in Central America, Central Africa, anywhere in the tropics, they'll catch live mosquitoes flying in midair. And they will take their eggs and glue those eggs to the underbelly of the mosquito. When the mosquito lands, like on a dog or a human, the heat from the, from the body of that human will melt that glue and those eggs will drop on the skin and those worms will dig in through a pore, like a hair follicle or something like that, and then they will start growing. What they eat is white blood cells. White blood cells are then dispatched to the area because that's an infection in your body. Your white blood cells are going there to attack it, but these bot flies eat white blood cells. We're feeding the bot flies. And that bot fly will grow inside that skin to a certain stage and then it'll ooze out and fall to the ground. And once it hits the ground, a couple days later, it'll turn into a fly. It's, I mean, it's weird. But anyway, there are also worms that eat vegetation. When you look at Joel chapter 1, verse 4, that which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. That which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. That which the canker worm, canker means to consume, to eat. Cank, if you've ever had a canker sore, you ever had a canker sore? I never got, I never had one. My sister used to always get them at picture time in school. Big one, right here. And, but cankers eat when you have cancer. Cancer eats. It eats up the body. That's where that word, Paul war warned about the teachings of Hymenaeus and Philetus. And he said, and this is true of any false prophet or false teacher, their word doth eat as a canker. Meaning, their teachings have a way of getting into your life and eating up the truth of the word of God. It's another form of how the devil will get into a person's life and destroy the word of God in them. So we have the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten, four things here. So it gives you... The spirit, there's a spiritual connection to this with those four types of worms that eat. And uh, then he says, Awake you drunkards, weep and howl, and all you drinkers of wine because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Speaking of wine, um, when yeast is cast into wine, leaven, the yeast eats the sugar. Out of the fresh grape juice, out of the new wine, it eats the sugar. It consumes the sweetness of it. And once it has eaten the sugar, it pukes methyl alcohol. Okay? You're looking at the waste of yeast that destroys new wine. And there's a lot of good teachings there. I'm taking a lot of time on this. I've got to move on. But anyway, so the worms, if we go back to, uh, where will we? Mark chapter 9. Verses 44, 46, and 48, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. One way of looking at this is that hell fire and the lake of fire is a continuous consumption. Where, number one, the fire is never quenched. The fire never goes out. And this is what we were talking about when it comes to hell and the lake of, the fire, lake of fire. The fire is never quenched. It just continues to burn and burn and burn, but the person is not burnt up. They have an, they have an everlasting body that's been cast into the lake of fire, and they are constantly consumed by that fire, but never totally destroyed. Then it could be said, and I, and I don't, I don't dispute this at all. Their worm dieth not. It could be that in hell or the lake of fire, uh, this is a direct quote from Isaiah 66, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. That's what Jesus was quoting when he was speaking there in Mark chapter 9. And he was talking about the lake of fire where all the, 
all the bodies or the corpses of those of the wicked have been cast into that. And for eternity, we, I believe, are going to look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed. And we're going to look at the lake of fire that is going to be an abhorring to us. Because their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And so it's possible that their worm refers to something that just consumes on their body, but never totally destroys that body. That body's eternal. And so it's going to be an endless eating. All right. So that's one way of looking at it. The Greek word, which I never, almost never reference Greek. And I'm not doing it in this case to correct the King James because King James is right. But it kind of gives you the idea that it's talking about a literal worm. A grub, a maggot or earthworm, skull leaks or skull aches is the Greek word here. And... Um, that's basically what it is and what it says. It's, it's a, some sort of, of worm. The word worm itself is an old English word. Here's the, etym you know me, I like etymology. I want to know where that word came from. Uh, in old times, the word worm was, was interchangeable with the word serpent or the word snake or dragon or reptile. Dragons of old were referred to as worms, W-Y-R-M. And so, you know, you have all these possible meanings here. There's, there's a serpent or a dragon. Those were referred to in olden time as a serpent, a snake, or a worm. Now, uh, we've already read Joel chapter 1. Turn to Job 17. In fact, turn to the book of Job. There's two verses out of here that I think is interesting. When it comes to understanding what Jesus meant by that. Number one, if you want to believe that there were literally worms on their bodies that were eating at them. You're, I mean, that's perfectly acceptable. I kind of think, however, because it says their worms shall not die. We know, by way of, we spent all this time studying hell, we know that it's the soul of man that departs into hell. And we know that that soul is aware, conscious, um, is lucid in knowing their condition, knowing the pain and the agony and the suffering they are in, the rich man realized where he was, why he was there. He wanted a, just a drop of water from Lazarus. Abraham said, can't do it. You're there. He's here. Can't, can't go across. Well, then send Lazarus back from the dead so he can warn my brothers about this place so they can repent. He said, they have Moses and the prophets. Then if, they, if I sent one back from the dead, they're not going to believe it. And God did. He sent Jesus back from the dead. People still don't believe it. Uh, Matthew and some of you guys was uh, witnessing to a man, a young man online in a, in a post that Matthew made, a video he made. And there was a man that got on there in the comment section that was doubting Christianity, doubting who Jesus was, the Son of God. And I, I'm proud of my son and for everybody that stood up for what we believe in. But this guy, I was talking to Lisa about it when Matthew called me. This guy, he wanted proof. I want 100% proof that Jesus is the Son of God. You're giving me Bible verses. Bible verses were written by men and they were copied and pasted and politically motivated and who knows what. And I told Lisa, I said, my experience is you give them scripture because if they won't believe God, you're not, you're not going to convince them. You're not going to say anything to change their mind. If they will not believe God, and they're going to call God a liar, God, God knows how to convince people that he's he. And if God is not convincing this man, it's for a reason. Maybe this guy, maybe this guy's time, Matthew, is 20 years from now. Maybe he's going to remember that somebody tried to witness to him. It's going to click. You plant a seed, you don't always see the seed grow right in front of you. 
wait 20 years, wait 30 years, wait for it to do something in this person's life. So your labor's never in vain. I appreciate that. But anyway, where was I going with that? That's pretty good. But anyway, um, we know that the Bible teaches that that soul does not die. That they're there, once cast into the lake of fire, they are consciously aware of that for eternity. So here's a, there's several places in the Bible, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And I have a couple witnesses to back up what I'm saying. Job 17, 14, I've said to corruption, thou art my father. And to the worm, thou art my mother and my sister. Now, the idea of the worm, if you study worm in the King James Bible, you will see that it has to do with corruption. In Joel chapter 1, it's the corruption of what they had planted out in their field. The locusts came, the caterpillars, the palmer worm, the canker worm, all four of those came and just destroyed their leaf, destroyed their vines, destroyed their trees, destroyed everything they had. So yes, it's related to corruption. I've said to corruption, thou art my father. To the worm, thou art my mother. Now, on the right-hand side of the screen, and I use this particular background for a reason. You have a rendering of DNA. DNA has always looked like two entwined serpents. Two coiled worms. Okay? That's what DNA looks like. I believe that the soul of man and the spirit of man are in his DNA. The spirit of God is in the words of this book, is it not? So I think that man's DNA is the source of man's spirit, who he is. Okay, the life, the spirit is life and DNA is what gives life. All right. So then Job 25. Open your Bible up so you can underline these verses. Job 25, verse 4. How then can a man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? He has said earlier that the worm was his mother and his sister. Okay? There is, I'll just throw this in for free. There's a portion of your DNA in your cells that only comes from your mother called mitochondrial DNA. Most of your DNA is in the cell nucleus. And that's what you got from your father and your mother. But there's a segment of DNA that controls the functioning of the cells. And that's all it does. Like it's the keeper of the house is what it is. And it only comes from your mother. In other words, in Lisa, her mitochondrial DNA does not come from Sterling. It only comes from you. And in Alicia, Lindsay, and Courtney, your mitochondrial DNA does not come from me. It comes from Lisa, which came from her, which came from her mom, which came from her mom, and so on. I'll just throw that in. But when it says, to the worm thou art my mother, scientifically, that's correct. Because there is a segment of your DNA that only comes from your mother. And I don't think Job or anybody, his buddies knew that back then. Okay. But anyway, verse five, behold, even to the moon and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. Verse six, how much less man that is a worm and the son of man, which is a worm. Now the words mean something. The Bible is not saying man, which is like a worm or is as a worm. It's saying man is a worm. The son of man, which is a worm. So, I kind of think that what the Bible's saying is right. My idea is that your soul is that worm. Turn to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Psalm 22 starts out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Where is that? Where else is that found in the Bible? Does anybody know? Wow. 
Give him extra credit for something. Mark 15. And what was going on in, that, in Mark 15? Come on, there's extra money here. There's extra credits here. Crucifixion. That's what Jesus said on the cross. And in Psalm 22, they pierced his hands and feet. They parted his garments, cast lots for his vesture. Um, not a bone of him was broken. And they mocked him. All of those things... There's like five things from Psalm 22 that show up at the crucifixion. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, when, but thou hearest not in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. Verse 6, but I am a worm and no man. A reproach of men and despised of the people. Now, I'm going to take you on a little side escapade here. All right? I'm going to leave Psalm 22 up on the screen. I want you to turn to John 3, where he says, I am a worm and no man. John chapter 3. What were the alternate? Let's see. Todd! How you doing, Todd? You know, if you sat closer to the middle, I'd pick on you more. What were some of the alternate meanings of the word worm? You can tell him, huh? Dragon? And? Serpent. You were going to say that next, weren't you? Okay. Now watch this. Remember, Psalm 22 is Christ on the cross, right? John chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the what? Serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have uh, eternal life, right? So, Christ... The Colossians says that he took on the form of his enemies, nailing them to his cross. Jesus, and when I first was studying this years ago, I went, okay, God, you're not saying that Jesus is the devil, because I'm not buying that one. And of course, that's not what he's saying. Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin. He became, he took on himself our enemies. So here is, when Christ is lifted up on the cross, he's showing the destruction of his enemies. And his enemy is Satan, the serpent. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even most, must the Son of Man be lifted up. And back in Psalm 22, he says, but I am a worm and no man. And Psalm 22 is about the cross. So the word worm, one of the definitions is, let me get it up on the screen here. Where was it? Where's my dragons and all that stuff? Where are they? Anyway, um, the, one of the definitions of the word worm is a serpent or dragon. All right? So, Psalm 22, I am a worm, and he's taking on the form of Satan on the cross, defeating Satan on the cross as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Uh, there's another illustration of this. When Moses took his rod and cast it to the ground, what did it become? Serpent. That's, that was a picture of Christ because when Aaron's rod was cast to the ground, it became a serpent. Pharaoh's magicians used enchantments and they did the same thing. They turned their rods into serpents as well. So you got all these snakes on the ground, right? But what happens? What? The word ate. Here's the, here's the real language. Aaron's rod swallowed up Pharaoh's rods. Swallowed up. Death is swallowed up in victory okay that's cool to me because that tells me that that is a picture 
of Christ destroying the power of his enemies on the cross. Okay? Thank you, John. I appreciate you got it. Okay, so we have two witnesses. Job, we have two in Job. We have one in Psalm that declares that man is a worm in Isaiah 41. Let me zoom this in for you. 4 I the Lord thy God will hold thy right hand saying unto thee fear not I will help thee fear not thou worm Jacob and ye men of Israel I will help thee saith the Lord and thy Redeemer the Holy One of Israel so now I've got I've got two references in Job one in Psalms one in Isaiah referring to us people as worms and remember what our DNA looks like it looks like worms it looks like Two worms together. So back in Isaiah, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. So we know that all the people that die and go to hell, their soul is what goes to hell. And that soul is never consumed in hell. It burns and burns and burns, but it's never consumed. Let me read these verses to you real quick. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. Psalm 16, 10, for thou will not leave my soul in hell. Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Psalm 26, 9, gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men. Psalm 33, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Psalm 56, for thou hast delivered my soul from death. Um, Psalm 62, truly my soul waiteth upon God, for him cometh my salvation. Psalm 63, 9, but those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. Psalm 86, 2, preserve my soul, for I am holy. Psalm 86, for great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. So when God saved us, he saved our soul. And our soul, remember, our body is just the shell, like a seed. When the seed is planted, that hard crust around that seed as soon as water hits it it starts corrupting it rots off so that what's inside there can be resurrected that's your soul okay that's your soul what's in there's three parts to man spirit soul and body and there's three parts to a seed and the outer shell is the body of man What's in the body of man corrupts so that the soul can rise again. But the soul then is given a different body. It's not a worm anymore. Okay? Now, there's your worm. Let me show you. I'm look at these worms. There you go. Throw that in the way for me. So here is the worm. Turn to Ezekiel 1. Ezekiel 1. You leave it on the good part, Megan. Ezekiel 1. In 
verse 4, I looked and behold a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. I actually have this, I think, in my notes somewhere here. Here it is. A whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, a fire enfolding in itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and every one had four faces, and every one had how many wings? Four. How many wings do butterflies have? They have four. Okay, because, let me give you these verses here. When you and I are resurrected, Matthew twenty two thirty 30 says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. When you and I are resurrected, we are going to take on, we're going to be given new bodies. Those new bodies, Jesus himself said, they are going to be as the angels of God in heaven. And these angels have four wings like butterflies do. So think of the worm, the caterpillar, the chrysalis is its casket, and it dies. But then... When it's resurrected, it does not come back out as a worm. Little girls don't go chasing around worms and caterpillars. But they do love butter. You like butterflies, Hope? See, she lit up. She went. You don't like worms, do you? She's thinking about it. She's going... Because butterflies are beautiful, and they have four wings, and it's a picture of us transformed. Um, Romans 8, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Remember, in Job, the sons of God, here in Job 1, the sons of God were the angels. Every place in the Old Testament where it says sons of God, it's referring to angels. But every place in the New Testament where it says sons of God, it's referring to us. We take their place. A third of them get kicked out. We get to move in their house. Like sovereign citizens, right, John? We've been, yeah, watching some of that stuff online. Anyway, for as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. For they have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but they have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us for the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. It's like a worm. Right now, there's not much to look at. But one of these days, our resurrection body, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, is not going to look anything like the body that it came from. It's going to be glorious like... Butterflies. By the way, see that sons of God up there? A photographer years ago noticed that he could see letters on butterfly wings. He thought, well, that's weird. So he spent, I don't know how much time, going around the world photographing butterfly wings. And he found, literally, every letter of the alphabet, including numbers, on the backs of butterfly wings. And he took pictures of them, made an album, I think, for, I can't, he published a book. But I want you to notice something in Ezekiel. Let's see if I can find it. Oh, let's see here. 
Um, where does it say? Help me find it. There's a place here in Ezekiel chapter 1 where it talks about the noise that their wings make. Ah, here it is, verse 24. Look at Ezekiel 1, 24. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech. When their wings, it's just like, how do crickets make their sound? What do they do? They rub their legs or their wings together. In heaven, these wings, that the sound that these angels' wings makes sounds like the voice of God and the voice of His speech. And here this guy found the letters of the alphabet on the backs of butterfly wings. The voice of speech. I think it's cool. 1 John 3. See, I've been talking about hell all, I'm talking about heaven now. You and I are the worm. Man is a worm. Man dies. Man's resurrected. And he's given a body made in the image like the angels of God. And that body is glorious and more beautiful than anything that man ever thought he could be. In John chapter, 1 John chapter 3, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. You see, right now, even though we don't have the body, we're still called the sons of God. And he said, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth, purifieth himself even as he is pure. Anyway, that's it. That's, that's all I have. Let's stand to our feet. I'm serious, I'm done. It's five o'clock. You can go now. I told you I was going to give you a little deal on worms. And I did. This is us now. This is us soon. And this is us forever. By the way, it said that we're going to be like Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God. Amen. Father in heaven... Your love for us is beyond our ability to fathom or describe it. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what it says. We believe what it means. And Father, we know we have this hope in us that one of these days you're going to take this vile body of ours and you're going to translate it. You're going to resurrect it. And the scripture says that what we become doesn't even look like what we are now. But you call us sons of God. And Father, we thank you for that adoption. We thank you, Lord, for the redemption of our bodies one of these days. And Father, we will gladly, we will gladly yield our bodies and our life over to your service and to your kingdom. Because, Father, what we believe, what you have taught us, Lord, is that there is a great reward awaiting all of us one of these days. We're going to get a glorious body, the likes of which have never been seen before. But Father, we can only see from Scripture little bits and pieces of what that body is going to be like. And the rest of it, Lord, is just hope, Father, that you will wipe away our tears. You'll remove all of our diseases and all of our sicknesses. You'll remove, Father, all of our sin nature. You'll take it and cast it away from us, and we will be your sons for all of eternity. We cannot even fathom that, Father, because we're limited here on this earth. 
But Father, we trust you. And Father, as bad as hell is, heaven is that much more glorious. And we await our time. Bless your people. Bless and honor your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.